in Unipis. Now, India is a party to a large number of international treaties. We have a chapter in the constitution called the Direct Principle of State Policy. Then there is a chapter called Fundamental Duties. Now, the earlier approach to the constitution was the directive principle is not enforceable. They are the non-enforceable part of the constitution. Fundamental duties are non-enforceable. But starting with Johnny John Verghese and other judgments, the Supreme Court had taken a trend that if India is a party <coughs> to an international covenant, and if that is traceable in the directive principles also, then it is possible, if you could read that in Article 21 of the Constitution, in the right to life, with broad aspects, and make it enforceable. So therefore, a trend had developed in, under the, in Jolly Vergis's case, it was a simple issue. Could a person who had no means to pay be imprisoned where he defaulted in payment of his digital amount. The law said such a person should be sent to jail because he has no means to pay and execute a decree. One of the modes of execution was of sending him to jail. But Justice Krishna had developed a very interesting thought, relying upon the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which said no person could be sent to jail or sent to prison if he had no means to pay. He said India is a party to this international convention and this forms, and if a man cannot pay, you can't deprive him of his liberty. And the way that in that case, he held, you can't send a man to jail, irrespective of the law that was in print going on Article 21. But coming back to Muni Krishna, a further step was taken by the Supreme Court. And I think that has, that, that has brought in tremendous change in the powers of the High Courts and the Supreme Court issue directions. For the first time, the Supreme Court said, you pursuant to the international conventions, Directive principle of fundamental duties. If you can read them into Article 21, the part of your right to life, then there is no need for a state positive law. There is no need for enactment to be there. It is open to the Supreme Court under Article 142 to issue directions to compel the government to enforce those conventional rights. And the High Courts, of course, followed suit under Article 226 by issuing directions. So today, in those areas where fundamental rights are involved, and if they can be located in Article 21, it is possible for this, and the Supreme Court has been doing, Vishak and all the other judgments, of laying down directions, which is not statutory law, but at the same time, enforceable directions, which can be enforced by a citizen by filing a petition or taking the post or the review. So therefore, when I went to the, when I came to the Allahabad High Court in <coughs> the month of June 2011, 2010, the first thing that I found was a large number of citizens coming forward, farmers and artisans, who had been unable to pay their <coughs> bank loans because of a drought in the area, because genuinely they were not able to pay the installment. And I found my judges had a tight copy. Yes, three installments, four installments. And I was coming from Bombay, I was wondering, what am I doing? Where is this right in me? It's a purely a contractual term between a, the bank on the one hand, and the borrower on the other. Where, where does the rich jurisdiction of the court come? 
And how do we do this? But look at it in hindsight. <coughs> These farmers, artisans who could not pay, what the High Court did was gave them some time to pay. <coughs> at the same time, the banks did not, did not go through the coercive process of recovery. And believe me when I say it, the statistics are being worked out in the state of UP, farmers' suicides are much lesser than in other parts of the country. Now, I don't say this all due to the steps that the High Court has taken, but to, in my opinion, considering the thousands of matters that have been filed in the High Court every year, to an extent, this positive step by the high court in this particular field <coughs> has helped in less formal suicide in the state of UP. The next issue that came before us was in the matter of poverty elevation programs. In our country today, we have a number of poverty elevation programs, NREG, Sakshya Ubel, Universal Education, where thousands of crores of rupees are being spent by the, by the central government in trying to achieve certain constitutional objectives of poverty eradication, removal of hunger, and outermost education so that each, each, my, each young child as a right to education. Now this required thousands of, <coughs> over a lack of uh, teachers to be employed. Now there's a small issue of employment, right to life, equality. Many of the, because of the inability of the state of UP providing infrastructure for teacher education, Many of the teachers were taught were taking the education outside. In universities recognized by the NCT, the National College of Education. In other institutions. And when they came to UP, they were told, well, you have no right to be selected because we have not passed up in the state of UP. Our high court intervened. In fact, the full bench is right by me and also we will intervene and said, no. The moment that course is required by NCT in any part of the country, that teacher has a right to be considered also for teaching training in the state of UP. So the result has been hundreds and thousands of teachers, and many amongst them are female teachers, because 50% of the posts were reserved for women teachers. The idea behind me, the large number of young children are girl children, they are small children. And therefore 50% reservation for the woman at a primary education level is required that was challenged. The so-called horizontal reservation. Our high court took the view that yes, Considering the, the children are to be taught that they are young children, that 50% practically of the young child, the young children who are coming to the courts, to the schools, our children, our women, our females, we have held that. Now you'll be asking what is, why, why is this so important? It is important because if you have Women teaching children at a young age and perhaps uh, more sensitized, more sensitive to the needs of the younger children, you, one, help to retain children in their classrooms and two, will be able to get a society where at least people will be informed of their basic rights. 
and has now been discussed earlier part of it. A society which is educated asks questions, inquires of their rights. And therefore, a society which asks and inquires of their rights is in a position to move, to challenge, to take decisions and to call upon the government to, as to why I will deprive those very children if they pass out the SEC in the schools in, the, in their villages. Next year we will be calling upon the election court so why is my parents not getting the elections with their entirety too. Tomorrow they will be asking in the classroom the teachers or the, the other authorities why have not been taught. These are two aspects of where we have gone in the field of quality and trying to bring over non arbitrary now, UP basically is a state which is ag agrarian character, still is not much in this life. If you examine the social impacts on every aspect, poverty, education, caste, it's a society written with caste. It's a society which is abject in poverty. There are huge areas. Now, in this, in this context, the government came up with some program of protecting the livelihood of those in traditional occupations. The one traditional occupation was the right to what is called sand mining, more and lifting. Now these are small things, small jobs, but to hundreds and thousands of people who were doing the work over the centuries and to whom this was the only profession Putting it in the open market would have resulted in deprivation of the only source of livelihood that we were doing, that we were getting. Our high court stepped in, held no, held yes. This step by the state is an affirmative action to protect the livelihood, and we upheld it. Similarly, we don't, the UP is not a state covered by the sea. But we have rivers, we have large ponds, and we have fisheries and fishes. Sometimes the dams have been built where we have fishing rights. And UP was a state where the zamindari system was there. All land belonged to those zamindars and the higher castes. Now that was abolished, and the result was the land rest in the state. The result has been a large number of lakes and other bodies are vested in the state. The question was, who has the right over these fisheries? Does Article 14, which means right to equality, would encompass everybody? Or is it open to the state in an affirmative action to protect the livelihood of those who are carrying out traditional occupations? The state enacted a law, issued regulations, <coughs> providing that what to societies of fishermen of the particular area would have the first right. Now this was a usual challenge by, by others who thought they could uh, fish in troubled waters, if I may use the expression. But I would <coughs> help, yes, this law has to be upheld. Because what we are doing is upholding certain traditional occupations giving them the right. Digressing a little, the question was asked, this is Panguli raised the question for Article 24. Should that section be repealed from the Constitution? I am not entering into a debate. No, I am not saying repeal. I am not entering into a debate. But UP has certain traditional occupation which Mr. Panguli also touched upon. Artisans. <coughs> weavers, hundreds of occupations. Now if you take away this occupation, you will have a large body of persons who will have no employment. Now should the children of these artisans, I will use the word artisans, be sent to for formal education or should they be inculcated 
into this informal education which will give them a light, give them a right to a livelihood in the future. Now many a time when we think of when we say the right of a child to education, yes, every child must be informed. Every child must be taught. Today money, but the money is no problem because thousands of crores are going to the service of here. But between not providing employment to the child when he grows up, and on the other hand, giving him the informal education of learning the profession, the balance has to be maintained. So there also, we have been able to balance both, of course we have not uh, Child labor is permitted in certain professions. Then we have had in the matter of uh, the principle behind primary education, I will just read what one of my judges has said as to why the installment has been granted. I think I will best explain it in his own words. This is Justice Khan, who is a party to the other judgment. And I will just put it in his words. You see, there's a case here also, there was, apart from the government recovery, the loan government was seeking 10% of the principal of, of the amount as these charges. And this is what he said If a farmer has not been able to pay loan along with interest, and recovery proceeds have initially against him, is rather cruel on the part of the state to extract 10% more from him as recovery charges. The farmers, particularly small farmers, are the most exploited lot in this country. If the price of anything except food gain grain rises, no one bothers. It is considered to be a sign of development. However, if prices of food grains rise, which may benefit the farmers to some extent, the entire country except the farmers start crying. The government should reconsider as to whether it serves social justice. In any manner by charging 10% recovery charges, which is quite huge from the farmers. And the philosophy article follows. Charging 10% recovery charge by the government from the farmers for recovery of loans advanced to them for agriculture purposes may be perfectly in accord with law. However, in order to justify it, the government would have to shed its facade of being a welfare state and dedicate it to the idea of social justice. If loans are advanced to the farmers more easily on lower rates of interest and recoverable in installments for a longer period of, for the sake of social justice, the same philosophy demands that the recovery the set amount, no recovery charges shall be realized from them. Law then then it says. Recovery temporary charges from a debtor who has not been able to pay the loan and the interest is justified in the name of pure, unabashed and uncontrolled capitalism. <coughs> it is shocking to the conscience, even though it may be legal, is like flogging a dying man. Law is a body of life of which may be experienced. However, spirit is policy of the government and conscious of the court. Both these aspects are guided and affected by various considerations. One of the important considerations prevailing conditions of society. So this has been the policy, the philosophy of my court. My judges in various issues have been issuing directions. For the moment, we are looking into the issue of the Sikh farmers of Banaras, who are Varnasi. They constitute a huge body of persons whose right livelihood is affected on account of heavy duty charge on import of losses from China. <coughs> this is all aspect that we are looking into. What I am trying to point out, we may have not had many learning judgments, but the philosophy of my court has been to reach to the poor, strike the mighty, and uphold constitutional values. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Chief, for very kindly projecting the, the, the challenges before your court and the way you are dealing with it. Now we have this uh, session on environmental talk mitigation. We will distinguish speakers are Roger, Richard Herman QC and Sapna Malik. You are Sapna Malik?
Thank you, but I, I would like kindly to request this office body to excuse me for my absence. Because tomorrow, you know, I'm very heavy. So here, unfortunately, in India, the judges have more briefs to read than the lawyers. <laughs> Therefore, I may be excused. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Justice Ganguly, for coming. Tomorrow you have 70 matters on your board. Um, thank you very much, sir. And we request Justice Sunil Ambani to chair this session. We are running about uh, one hour late, half an hour late. So, sir, we'll go till 12.45 for Richard Hermer and Sapna Malik, and from 1.15 to 1.30, sir. And then lunch will be half an hour late. Thank you, Justice Ambani. I requested Richard Hammer to give his presentation along with Sadhana. It's a great privilege uh, to be here today to address you. It's also, if I may say, a particular pleasure to be here at the invitation of the HRLN, which is not only a well known and extremely respected body in this country, but internationally is the subject of admiration. And if I could just say, as someone who, in my most pretentious moments, fashions myself as a human rights lawyer, to spend time with Colin at his office, listening to the work that he does, is a thoroughly humbling uh, experience. In the bad of its heart, I think, giving the quality of access to justice, uh, and that's at the heart what of these things <coughs> are about. So over the course, I think really of the last 15 years, the English courts have seen the emergence of claims in which large groups of citizens of foreign countries have brought tort claims against UK-based multinational corporations for damages that they sustained in their home state. For example, uh, last year, on the eve of trial, a settlement was reached in a case brought by 30,000 citizens of the Ivory Coast against a commodity broker uh, British-based commodity broker, who, who uh, were alleged to have been responsible for dumping toxic waste in the commercial capital of the Ivory Coast, causing damage to 100,000 people required medical uh, treatment. Uh, a year before that, uh, uh, there was an out-of-court settlement in a case brought against BP by Colombian farmers living in a very remote part of uh, Colombia who claimed damages that damaged their, la their, their land arising out of the construction of a pipeline. And in October of this year, the Queen's Bench Division in London is going to hear a trial brought by 33 Peruvian nationals, again living in a very remote part, a very poor part of Peru, uh, against a British multinational mining company, who it is said were complicit in their torture and mistreatment when they were protesting about the development of the mine. We, we thought, Sapna and I, uh, that perhaps an a, a, a interesting way in is that Sapna will talk about some of the cases and the development of the cases over the past 15 years, and then I'll just try and tie in at the end two things. One, uh, try and yeah, addressing all of you. Um, I'm going to um, try and do a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour through the, through the cases we've been running, um, maybe not quite as quickly as Joshua's two minutes per case of yesterday, but... Um, I'll try to keep it quite tight and just to key issues. Um, and I think that you, you'll you probably see that, um, although, as Richard said, not not quite totally on point with, with the topic of, um, of, of this colloquium, they, they do raise issues of inequality and indignity and injustice um, on an international scale. Um, and we're here at particular times, so obviously the legal landscape continues to change. Um, so just a, a run through some of the cases um, that, that we've been bringing. Um, the first case concerns uh, a mercury processing plant um, operated by a British company called Thor Chemicals, uh, which used to operate in the UK, came under a lot of criticism in the 80s by the, health, the, the regulatory health body there, criticisms that there were very high levels of mercury found in the blood and the urine of the workers. Um, the director of Enchant um, Factory, everything over to South Africa, to Natal province in South, in South Africa, were again um, used very, the, the same techniques that you've been criticised for using. 
um, in the UK. Um, and practice a particularly callous process of recycling workers, that they would reach a particular level of, of mercury, a particular level of mercury would get into their blood, they didn't want it to die, so they would be sort of um, relieved for a bit and then, then brought back again. And eventually, three workers did die, um, and criminal proceedings were brought in South Africa, uh, where a fine equivalent to £3,000 was levelled against the company, which um, did not have a, a massive uh, deterrent impact. And uh, the, the, the company ran via a, the, the UK parent company as well as a, a, a subsidiary company in South Africa. argue for a piercing of the corporate veil, but we argue that the parent company was so intrinsically involved in, in running the plant on the ground that it, it had direct liability. Um, it was responsible for the negligent design and transfer and set up and the operation of the plant. Thor unsuccessfully tried to stay the action on the grounds of foreign non-convenience. Um, the, it was accepted that the, the, because the allegations centred a lot around the torts that took place and the breaches that took place in, in, in the UK, in the uh, ordering level in the UK, that that was sufficiently connected to the, to the English jurisdiction. Um, and um, in, a, in a British court. Um, a second wave of claims was then brought, um, and for, shortly before trial, that one got a lot closer to trial, as is often the case with second waves of claim that the defendant fights a lot harder. Um, and sh very shortly before court, a month or so before court, um, we became aware that the company was restructuring, and um, it first established an asbestos mine uh, in South Africa in 1913, mining blue asbestos, really the most deadly type of asbestos. Um, and shortly afterwards it opened a factory in London, just on the outskirts of London, where it was processing some of this asbestos. Um, it, 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 it had opened various mines and mills um, in South Africa. And again, the English company was directly operating these mines until 1948. Thereafter, it did set up some African <coughs> companies, which were comments that the masks, they couldn't find masks that would fit sort of the African face, so they didn't, didn't provide masks um, to a lot of the workers or, or only provided ones that uh, served no purpose at all. Um, they did carry out very rudimentary health checks the, the x-rays and the health checks to their white workers were far superior to those to their um, uh, coloured and, and black workforce. Um, and so over time, there was this massive legacy of asbestos-related disease, asbestosis, with the lungs getting clogged up with asbestos, and mesothelioma, a really deadly um, cancer of the, the lining of the lungs. <laughs> Um, and this was all when um, asbestos regulations had, had been in place in the UK so since 1931. It was clear by the 1930s um, that um, asbestos really did cause um, immense harm. And solvents, there would have been no, no point seeing them. There was no insurance in place for them, or certainly none that we were aware of. And again, um, from the investigations that we made, um, we felt that there was sufficient evidence to hold the parent company again directly liable um, for what had happened on the ground. Um, in this case, there were very protracted forum non-convenience proceedings. The company very much wanted the, the case to be brought in, in South Africa. We could get access to the medical experts, the technical experts that we required to be able to fight tape um, on an equal footing. Um, and, and over time, um, legal aid wasn't available in South Africa for these sorts of cases. And again, at that time, there was a, a group structure available. Um, there ended up being 7,000 um, claimants, and we argued that the time it would take to, to coordinate all the cases would mean that a, potentially a lot of people um, could, could die um, in, during that process or not get access to justice. Um, and in we, the, the case went up to the House of Lords, the UK had then House of Lords now would be the Supreme Court, um, supported the idea of the cases being brought in the UK that, um, that the, the new South African government could not deal with all the, the, the legacy problems um, of apartheid and, and its courts shouldn't be overwhelmingly burdened with, um, uh, with, with, with all these actions. Um, 
and the House of Lords did unanimously hold that that forum should remain in the UK, um, essentially um, because there, there would not be, it, it accepted that there would not be adequate funding for all the um, for actions allegedly committed overseas, um, not just applying the principle to, to British multinationals. Um, we uh, represented over a thousand uh, Maasai and Samburu pastoralists from Kenya um, earlier. Uh, it, it exploded ordinances on, on, on the ranges, uh, which contrasted to their exercises back in the UK and also. Um, on occasion where they did use the land of white ranchers in South Africa and uh, in, in Kenya and um, did very thorough clean-up jobs. Um, often, uh, as, as we heard again, taking many testimonies from, from the clients, uh, would often see little trinkets, little, little things that they, they felt that they would um, use uh, for adornments, which actually were bombs. Uh, and um, there were many cases of, of or, or even their cattle would just step on on onto these unexploded bombs um, as they in cases in which it has arisen, um, the defendants rather than seeking to baffle it have, have chosen to settle. But undoubtedly um, it will be an issue before the courts. Um, could can I then turn um, very briefly to the, the question of cost tool in holding corporations to account but it is not a panacea. Based on, on my experience in these cases, uh, 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 including the cases that uh, Sutton and Richard have talked about, I suggest there are uh, six uh, advantages that I can see in a tort model uh, compared, for example, to the public interest litigation model that uh, I understand is more prevalent here in India. The first is this question of jurisdiction. Uh, the transnational tort model allows a claimant in a country such as Colombia or Ivory Coast, uh, in a case where the facts have nothing <coughs> whatsoever to do with the UK, uh, to come to the English court uh, as of right if the defendant or the relevant corporate entity uh, is domiciled uh, within the meaning of European law, uh, within uh, England and Wales. Uh, and that is incredibly powerful, particularly in light of the new European law that Richard talked about, because you don't get uh, uh, costly preliminary arguments about discretion. It's a matter of right. Nor, uh, interestingly, do you, do you have to establish that there is any public interest. Indeed, in those cases that Sutton and Richard talked about, uh, there would not be any public interest in the formal legal sense, albeit the cases would be of great interest to the public. There is no public interest generally because, in the legal sense because the cases, the facts, are not directly concerned with the UK, except perhaps, for example, in the Kenyan case or, or one or two others where the UK government is, is, is directly implicated. The second uh, advantage is, is the nature of the remedy, damages. Uh, the intention being to put the claimant in the position so far as money can do, uh, that they would have been in had the wrong not been committed. Uh, that is plainly uh, an important object of, of human rights law, and it is one that uh, a tort claim properly brought can achieve. Uh, subject to the point, of course, that uh, often these claims are settled, so what one never knows necessarily that what a claim has received is in fact 100% compensation for the wrong they have suffered. The third point that Richard mentioned was, was this, and, and, and Sutner went into, was, it, was, was, was this question of, of, of conditional fee arrangements. Uh, these arrangements essentially mean that uh, if the claimant loses the case, the claimant does not have to pay uh, any fees to its own lawyers. If the claimant is, is successful, then the lawyer will be paid, albeit the payment essentially will come from the defendant. Uh, this, I think, is, is an incredibly powerful tool because it promotes this idea of equality of access. Uh, Colombian farmers and the 30,000 Ivory Coast uh, victims of, of the Trafigura incident uh, would not otherwise have had the funds to come to London and take on BP and Trafigura respectively. In both of those cases, BP and Trafigura 
uh, instructed Freshfields, which is one of the city of London's most prominent, and it's fair to say probably most costly, uh, law, law firms, and they in turn would have instructed very expensive counsel. But the fact that we have these uh, conditional fee arrangements in place means that there can be some sort of equality of arms. The fourth point, and this is really a point from an NGO perspective, and it's something I've thought about having talked to NGOs, particularly ones who've been involved in the traffic era case, is the question of disclosure. Once you begin a claim in the English High Court with jurisdiction, the defendant becomes subject to the very rigorous disclosure regime in the High Court. <coughs> Put simply, the claimant can go to the High Court and say, for example, uh, one issue in this case <coughs> is uh, what, well, what instructions were given at a particular stage, what due diligence was done, what thought was given to making the decisions you made, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can go and you can say, uh, you have not uh, given me disclosure on these issues. These issues are relevant in this litigation. I want the judge to order that, the, that, that, that you must give me disclosure. And generally, albeit there will often be a big argument, a big fight, uh, if the judge agrees, there will be an order, and the company will have to go and search its offices and, and, its, and its email, uh, uh, its computers, its, e its email servers, and it will have to give disclosure of these documents. I've seen from NGOs just how powerful that is. Not it's not just about the litigation. It's about NGOs actually starting to piece together the story. Because until those documents come out, it's all too easy for, 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 for corporations to plausibly deny what uh, NGOs suspect may have been the case, but, but which they can never quite prove without the documents. The fifth point, and I know this was a very important issue in the Trafigura case, is the question of defamation. Corporations are very, very uh, keen to protect their reputations. And uh, Trafigura, I know particularly, was keen to protect its reputation and was extremely aggressive in uh, pursuing those who it felt had uh, not uh, represented uh, its story uh, in the way that it wanted, to the extent that uh, it wasn't simply a question of making of, of, of those who made completely erroneous allegations. Uh, when, for example, uh, various newspapers uh, <coughs> use words that weren't quite consistent with the way the traffic era felt precisely the way the story should be put. I know for a fact the newspaper editors were getting very aggressive letters uh, saying you will you will you will apologise or you will, you will change that. And and the most the most uh, well known uh, instance of this tactic was when Newsnight, the, a, a programme on the BBC, ran a story about the traffic era case, uh, and the reporter. Uh, I, th I think this is the driver, certainly will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, so, perhaps uh, overstated what was established fact about the link between the, uh, the dumping of the toxic waste and, and the question of whether that had caused deaths as opposed to uh, serious illnesses. Uh, and there was, uh, there, was an th 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 there was an application for an injunction against Newsnight and there was some very aggressive defamation proceedings. But the point I want to make is that when you're operating under the cloak of litigation, you have uh, defences for those defamation actions that an ordinary NGO writing reports or, or a journalist <coughs> wouldn't have, which I think is another very, very important reason why litigation can be, can, can be a useful tool in these, in these circumstances. And, and the final, the sixth point I have is, is the question of enforceability. Uh, I, I have a claim that's been running for a few years now where judgments were given by the Liberian, by the Supreme Court of Liberia against American corporations. Uh, the Americans went, have, have been uh, resisting enforcement tooth and nail amongst, on among other grounds, the ground that the Liberian Supreme Court got Liberian law wrong. And on that basis, the judgment was unenforceable. And they went to the American court. So at, a, at an interlocutory stage, the American judges have agreed. Uh, yes, indeed, the Liberian Supreme Court got Liberian law wrong. It, was like, it wasn't even Liberian statute law. Uh, uh, the, the, there are lots of complex enforcement procedures going on. But perhaps as an unfortunate practical reality, 
it, it, it would be much easier to enforce an English High Court judgment. Indeed, one would expect that if you obtain such a judgment, a company such as BP and Trafigura would simply have no choice other than to honour it, and that would be the end of the matter. Uh, those are the advantages that immediately occur to me of, 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 of the taught model. One disadvantage that immediately occurs to me, perhaps again from the perspective of the NGOs and the, and, and the activists, is this. Once the case goes into litigation, 